Hello, welcome to the podcast. I am super, 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 super happy to have you both on the podcast today. We're going to try something new. We haven't done this before, uh, but couldn't think of two two nicer, incredible people to to try this with. So thank you so much for taking time, Johnny and Pedro. You're you're both amazing. Uh, this is two incredible, uh, incredible creatives from from Ogilvy, and you're both in different places in the world right now, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm currently in Toronto and Johnny, he's in Brazil. I used to be in Ogilvy, Brazil as well, but I uh, moved here a couple months ago to, to work at Ogilvy, Toronto. So it's been a fun journey. And I Johnny, see. he's still uh, still in Ogilvy, Brazil, right? Yeah, so I'm a, I'm a copywriter at Ogilvy, Brazil. Pedro and I, we actually were a copywriter and art director, a, a duo, a part, partners. And we worked together, I think, for two years, something like that. Yeah, and, yeah. Yeah, he's an absolute, like... A joy to work with, a super great friend. We still keep in touch, but he's now at Ogilvy uh, Canada, and I am still in Ogilvy Brazil. So, Pedro, it wasn't anything Johnny said to make you move to a different country, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I always loved working with Johnny. He's he's great, honestly, awesome. Have great memories of all the projects we worked on together. Great copywriter, and yeah, and thank you so much for having us, Chris. Honestly, we're yeah, so excited to. To be talking here, we've, so, been, uh, we've been like anticipating this this recording for maybe I don't know a couple months. I don't know, maybe yeah, long. Just, so yeah. good to be here. Uh, I'll say, but it's, it's an honor to have you here, and and also congrats on all of your many awards as well. I mean, I know you've you've both been won not just Can Lions awards, but you've also won pretty much everything else there is to win. So so congrats on being you. I don't know what they put in the water in Brazil, but there seems to be so many talented creatives over there. Uh, congratulations. Yeah, well, thank um, you for that uh, compliment. I mean, and we, can, we we're going to get into that later on, I think. But I mean, it's yeah, we're just I, I feel personally very grateful for what's what's happening career wise for us. And uh, I think Pedro feels the same way. And but we I mean, we worked really hard on everything and we always like we just care about the work a lot like with this is something we enjoy and it's something that we talk about almost as if we talk about movies and tv shows we actually love it and we can talk for hours and that's why we're talking with you with you today <laughs> and we hope like that our passion will just seep into everyone's minds and, and and hearts by listening to this and yeah we're just super happy to to be here I'm sure it will. So yeah, I mean, that, that's, uh, we're going to try a little bit of an experiment today. So the idea is that we all get to see these amazing case studies, but very rarely do you get to hear about the work behind the work. And so the idea we're going to go through today, and hopefully it works out well, if you're listening, let us know how we did, is we're going to look at a case study that, that you've, you've created, which is a piece of work that you've created and the case study that goes with it. And then we're going to go through that work from the challenge, the insight, the idea, the mechanics, and then even how you put the case study together. Because I think that's an art in itself. If you're, we're going to play the case study now. If you are listening on Spotify or YouTube or most of them, you will be able to watch the video as well. If you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts, shame. You'll get the audio, but listen to the, to watch the case study. If you just Google for this or look for this on YouTube or look for this on Spotify, you can watch the case study as well. So here we go. The temporal landmark is a law that limits the freedom of Brazil's indigenous people. It's an unfair decision that takes away lands they occupied before 1988. Despite their cry for help, no one is paying attention. And this isn't something we should just scroll on by, but a flag we can all help raise. Saved flags. Saving indigenous posts on Instagram to save their people in the Amazon. A movement that turned the save icon into indigenous body paint. By leveraging the algorithm's preference to make saved posts more visible, we gave more visibility to the indigenous cause. And the trend became like the Amazon, borderless. So to encourage people to save indigenous content. This is going to be telling me all about... Celebrities joined the conversation. Even Emmy winner Pita Teuruewawau saved our posts. Several NGOs took part in the movement. And the streets went tribal. Catching the media's attention. Nós 
precisamos da nossa terra para viver. O direito dos povos indígenas é anterior à própria Constituição, à própria concepção de Estado. Most importantly, we not only change people's feet. As terras por eles tradicionalmente ocupadas traduzem sobretudo e principalmente direitos fundamentais. We help plant the native's flag in their own lands. Saved flags. Save indigenous posts and help save their territory. <laughs> it's an incredible case study, guys. Thank uh, you. Bravo. Thank you. Cool. So where should we start? Who wants to go first? Tell us about this, this piece of work. Uh, it's, it's pretty brilliant. So congrats. Thank you. I think, Johnny, you can you can start with this one. Sure. I mean, let's start with the challenge, right? So first off, just to give a little context, this was a, a completely proactive idea, like within Ogilvy, Brazil. So it's something that basically, uh, for those who aren't in advertising, don't know the term. It just means that the creative team came up with it by themselves. It wasn't like given by a client for a specific job. And so the challenge was, like the case study said at the beginning, there is this temporal landmark, which is a really, let's say, unfair law in terms of the indigenous population in Brazil, because it basically invalidates the claim to the, to the land that they have ownership over, like up until the the Brazilian constitution, so which is 1988, was when the constitution was uh, implemented. Yeah, so any lands, like, after that, they, they have no, uh, no claim over geographically. And so that was the challenge, this temporal landmark, and also the whole, like, discussion in Brazil in term, in, like, around that issue as well was something that we've, we found was a really uh, a, a hot issue like a hot button topic, you know, we wanted to address. So was this something that just, you know, would have been on the local news and, and, you know, when you're chatting to other people in the agency or just your friends, this would have, this is something that would have come up a conversation time and time again. Like there's this problem. I wish there was a solution. Yeah. Um, and actually, Chris, even something interesting that you brought that up, because one of the reasons we even actually started with this campaign was because it wasn't getting actually enough coverage originally. So the big, I'd say the bigger issue was not only that, well, first there was this law that had just been approved in the Chamber of Deputies in, in Brazil. So like it was like a step into coming into fruition, but it wasn't being really talked about. So it's like, okay, we have this really big issue and how do we get people to talk about it? How do we get people to engage with it? And that's really when we started like looking into, okay, like what are ways we can go around the system or, or any hack on in social media? Like how do we, how do we get this into the, the big mediums? So they'll also be talking about it. So I think that's definitely where we started from. Yeah. And uh, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, was there a particular person or a particular thing that that drew you both to to trying to come up with a solution for this particular problem? Yeah, so I forgot to mention, we did this as a trio. So it was me as a copywriter, and then Pedro and Caio uh, were the two art directors. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, Caio was the one who initially brought the idea, like the spark of the idea. And then, you know, it just flowed naturally between the three of us. And yes, it is a topic that, well, at least in the agency and and most of, um, you know, people our age group we're talking about, it's a real, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a serious issue. It's not mm. super fun, like, yeah. uh, mm. in terms of like a, a discussion in a bar, say with friends, but, uh, yeah, like Pedro said, we thought we could contribute with our creativity. And personally, I love ideas that hack something because it's simple. It's, and Brazil's known for this, like in Brazilian advertising has always excelled when we uh, we use low budgets ideas that can hack something and there's like a huge result you know in term because of that and so yeah I, I guess that's kind of like the context for the the challenge part of the idea and but there's a lot I guess, to, to say 
Yeah, and I guess also the the yeah having if you're doing the, these things as pro bono, having that limit on you know you can't spend loads of money. You you've right. got to find a hack solution. It kind of yeah you know, that what is it? Give me the freedom of a tight brief. And sort of guess you had your 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 self imposed tight brief. They would say bravo. Exactly. Yeah, and what was the next step? So I guess you need to pass this by the agency and make sure it's something that they they're kind of okay doing. So do you come up with ideas and then? I guess pitch it to your creative director or, or someone else and then open that. Did hey, you want to talk? Yeah, I mean, it was well, first thing again, we have we had this whole insight talking about this. So first we we spent a while thinking about like how how can we do something interesting. We eventually landed on the save button on Instagram because it's very for for a couple of reasons. One, it's a very ownable symbol, like it's it's something that hasn't been used very often it's it can be easily like integrated into like the cultural aspect of the indigenous body paint so they could use it as a body paint almost make this icon as a a symbol to their movement Mm -hmm. and it's something everyone knows it's something everyone can interact with and then there's even the plus up that it's one of the things that gives the most visibility on instagram it gives more than a like than a a comment how did Uh, you find that out was that just random or Oh yeah, that was that was a that was a very uh, happy happy coincidence, I'd say. But it was really researching about metrics, and one day we're like, "Oh wait a second! Like, this metric is it's actually like two times any other metric, so we can really make things more visible if people start liking instead of liking." So it's almost like uh, changing the behavior in a way of mm-hmm. of how people interact with their content. And yeah, I mean, we we packaged this idea, we made it, you know look nice and uh, we also talked to some uh, indigenous friends and uh, people we know i know a couple indigenous photographers in brazil so like i I gave them a call i'm like hey like what do you think of this and they like jumped on it immediately they're like hey we'll we'll do it you really want to participate and then it was just like basically talking to our at the time sergio mugnine uh again great guy he he's like very crafty Uh, he loves things that have craft in them and when we were like yo we're gonna paint this He's like, yo, let's do it, you know. So it was, it was really cool. Yeah, I mean, it, the, the case study looks really, really stunning. So, uh, so thank you. Rat. I mean, I'm sure we'll get into more of that. Yes, and just to compliment Pedro, I think he mentioned it, but the the like we've never seen an idea done for the, I mean, Instagram ideas themselves, but for the specific button that's the save icon, it's like you know, a di- like a dime a dozen, really rare. And so just to zone in on that specific part of the idea was something novel and original. And yeah, it was like fertile ground for, like I said, a creative idea. And yeah, we, we thought it was a, a nice territory to explore. I was going to say, how did you go and about actually making this all happen and, and getting this all done? Was it, I know you were saying you, you phoned up some photographers. It's great. Like <laughs> photography tick. Was it, was it kind of lots of stuff like that? Just trying to pull pull in favors, speak to people that you know in different areas and, and just putting it all together. It was exactly that, actually. Uh, so we, we phoned some of these indigenous photographers we knew, and they already knew some other people that would be willing to be the ones on in the photos as well. So, you know, they talked to us. We were in a lot of calls. We were like in calls every day with different people. And it was very much a thing of, uh, you know, just everyone trying to help each other. And what was really cool is that, uh, well, we did it. And if even in the case study, you can see that we even have a part that's like several NGOs took part in the movement is because originally we were going to start doing this whole project fund NGO that was in Brazil. But as the project started to move on, other NGOs started to message us and be like, hey, we want to be part of this. And we're like, yeah, awesome. Like the more people participate, the better it is. So we just, you know, did also like content for them to the to the ngos yeah it's just just... they want to take part they want to it's for a good cause and uh yeah like pedro said we were even on a call once with uh, one of the indigenous photographers in the north of brazil in the amazon and so obviously the, the 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 internet connection wasn't very very good at times and I think his little uh, cousin or his nephew came along and showed him like a toy at one point. So it was just, for me, it was such a surreal moment because we're talking to a native in, like indigenous person in the Amazon, but he's right there in the moment, you know. For mm-hmm. me, it was like super, 
strange in a good way. I never had that experience before. But it felt so real. Like we wanted, above all for this case, we wanted authenticity. We wanted to be true to the, you know, to their culture. We didn't want to be like just two white guys who are trying to use this for our own cause. No, like we genuinely went after the people who represent the culture best. And we did it as faithfully as possible, you know, within the, the realms that we had, the limitations we had. I mean, it looks like the results look amazing. Was it, was it a, you know, was it, was it, was it all plain sailing or were the, were the sort of bumps along the road where you're like, okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> how did you, how did you kick it off? Like I, I often find you have these great ideas and then even if you have some, some great people behind it who are helping you out, it's, it's so hard to get traction and get that coverage particularly right. now where I think with mass media, they're all kind of like, you basically have to pay them or have something that's really newsworthy and different to get written about. So how, how did you kind of overcome those challenges and, and make this sort of go so viral and mainstream? Well, I think one of them was a lot of the of indigenous influencers. They definitely I, made a big difference and they had context as well. So they sort of used their context to really help us. I also had a a friend of mine who helped do a couple of PR releases outside of Brazil because, nice. uh, I mean, usually, uh, you can see in the case study, we were able to get a couple of you write about it from outside Brazil, which was really good because we also wanted uh, people from other countries to, um, again, be talking about it. And we also got an international indigenous NGO that's called Indigenous Peoples Movement. And uh, they also helped, like, definitely take it to another level of, like, you know, people talking about it. And the good thing is that in Brazil, they ha there's already a very strong like uh, indigenous activism and they also really picked it up and they used this as a way to push against the temporal mark, which, uh, which was great. Cause then, you know, this was, a was able to be like a step in, into their cause and help them out, which is again, which is what we really wanted. So we were super happy that it was, uh, yeah, that it was, it was a success in this way for sure. With, with, with the timing, did you find that you had to sort of push things around a particular date like as though if you're particularly I know when in from past experience when you were working with influencers or working with with multiple charities or organizations if you want something to be picked up and and get some traction it help, helps to kind of build it around a, a time or a moment or a day so that there's a lot of activity happening on once so the sort of you know, can push right. through the filter did 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 you find you had to do any of that or was it I easier mean, it would yeah, I mean, it, it was, uh, speaking of like bumps in the road, it was more just like a grassroots effort on our part. Right. We we didn't have too much like in terms of planning, like in the a planning department in, in the, that sense. So we didn't have a schedule. We just wanted to make this happen, you know, put it out in the world. Properly creative led then. Yeah, no planning. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it was very creative led. And yeah. um, thankfully we had the, the blessing of like, you know, our creative director and the CCO yeah. as well. But because uh, the idea came from the creative department, there wasn't like, a, you know, a meeting for insights or, you know, a planning session, anything like that. In that sense, it was good because we had more control over the idea. In another sense, you know, maybe we would have benefited more if we had like strong pillars that supported the, the insights. And But, you know, it is what it is. We we worked with what we had and, you know, everything's like a learning process for us. That yeah, makes sense. I mean, do you in general, do you have a process that you prefer that like, you know, and you've both had lots of experience working across lots of different clients and lots of different agencies, I think as well. Is there a rough route that you found that works to get better ideas out than like, so sort of, is there a process that, that you find tends to work or tends to create better ideas that that, that go further like as uh, yeah. or uh, you could ask the opposite of that other things that you know really easily kill creative ideas you can start <laughs> i, I mean, can see your brains already for whole, like for an episode on itself by itself <laughs> but uh let me think i think uh, this may be a bit controversial but i think like this for example this idea and even magic audios it didn't come from you know from having me having meetings like having a brief basically it came from just us having fun and fun, I know this is a serious idea, like Safe Flags is a serious idea, but we had fun in, in the sense that we had creative freedom to play around, you know. We didn't have limitations from anyone saying, oh, you can't do this, you can't do that. So for me personally, I think that the best ideas come when you're like in a relaxed state of mind, when there's not 
too much pressure. There has to be a little bit pressure, a little mm -hmm. bit of pressure, obviously. But I think it's super important for the creative, the creatives to have freedom and to just play around. And also for me personally, I I always believe like Muhammad Ali said that half of the the fight is like when he's training, you know. And so I I take it to heart that I study. Uh, your podcast, Chris, like I study other advertising podcasts and video case case studies and just immerse myself in the in the world of advertising. And, you know, obviously I watch a lot of movies and, and anime and video games and all the nerdy good stuff of pop culture. And I truly believe like the more you do that, it's one of the few professions that you can do that and you have a like a career benefit in terms of results, output. The more you absorb and, you know, Obviously, you need a little criteria what you put into your mind. But I think it's fair game that the more you have, like the the better the ideas are going to come. Totally agree. Yeah, you want that kind of wide breadth of of different experiences, so that when you're trying to come up with a creative idea, I guess you can bring to bear things that maybe are slightly left field from just you know that maybe you'd get to a different place than if you were just looking at just advertising. <laughs> Like if that makes sense of your exactly. your inputs, and you you sound like someone who he's always naturally interested in the world around them and and lots of different things. Like, oh, I don't know about that. Let me know, let me learn about it. Like Pedro is as well. He's like Bravo. <laughs> yeah, bro, Bravo to you both. Uh, thank you, man. Thank you. Oh, thank but yeah, you. I mean, uh, I agree with Johnny as well. Uh, references. I mean, absorb as many as possible from everywhere. Like especially like for me being an art director, to me it's like. I try to see everything with an art directional eye because I feel like everything is designed, like design is everywhere. Like a, a way a room is set up is a, is designed. So I think it's just like always looking and trying to find why things are where they are. And I feel like that helps the brain. And I think simplicity too. I mean, the best ideas are simple ideas. I feel like, uh, especially if you look at Canon almost every year, you have so many simple ideas that are so smart. It's all about it. I think more than like thinking it, it's just, it's like who saw it first in a way. It's like the first person to point it out. Oh, have you ever noticed that this? And then everyone goes, oh my God, you're right. That is the, so I feel like that really, you know, I try to really, again, when I'm thinking of ideas with, uh, with other people and I know Johnny as well, when we were always trying to have ideas, like, okay, so what, how can we make this as, as, as simple as possible? Like, can I explain it in one sentence? And sort of those challenges to ourselves in terms to like almost test the idea to see like how strong it is and how it works. So I think that's the process that has been working, at least for me, in the past yeah, couple of years. Just to, just to add to that, one of the factors for this idea that really made it come to life was basically, uh, you know, persistence. We had, I think, I don't know how many, Pedro knows this better than I probably, but we had tons of versions of the video case, case study, maybe over 30. I'm not sure anymore. Wow. Uh, yeah. There was so much that I just, I don't remember. But we, um, yeah, it's it's about identifying it, like seeing something that others haven't seen, but also like how much are you going to, you know, defend the idea? People are going to say it's it's not good. Like, I don't know, it's been done before. It's too similar to this or, or that. But if you truly believe it, like it happened with this idea specifically, then uh, yeah, you can make it happen. So a lot of it's, I mean, most of it is basically just persisting, not giving up. Like any job, really, it's not something that's only in advertising, but I think especially in advertising, because ideas are so, are so fragile, I almost compare it to like running a, an egg race with an egg on your spoon and you have you can't like, drop it on the ground. Yeah, any like little wind that comes along or someone bumps into you, it's going to fall and break. And so you really have to first care about it a lot, like have passion and... Just don't give up. Like Churchill said, like, never, 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 never give up. I think it's the same with advertising. That's good advice. And uh, yeah, I mean, I always think it's sort of the hardest job in, in an agency in a world way is being a creative in that you say many of your ideas that you put so much passion into yeah. get destroyed for often for no particular reason. On a daily basis. And, so yeah, you've got to have very thick skin, but I agree. It's sort of if I think back to great campaigns I've been privileged enough to work on over the years, you're absolutely right. There was always a few people who would just like never give up consistently going, no, we're going to get this done. We're going to make this happen. Sure. So that's, that's great advice. And we mentioned a little bit about the case study there. And I think it 
be interesting to talk about it because it's case studies can make or break whether something gets awarded or not. Yeah, you've got two minutes, which isn't a lot of time right. to tell a story. You chaps seem to be particularly good at it. I've, I've looked at your sort of portfolios and looked through a few of the case studies. They're, they're all pretty amazing. It'd be great to get your, your advice and your tips on what makes a great case study. Is there a formula that you found tends to work? I'll, I'll start this one. So I feel like it's interesting because the more you look at case studies, the more you start to identify the tropes sort of. So there's always like the, the famous presenting this trope or the in X country, this happens trope. So you can sort of identify, but I think there's an interesting formula that I think is a good starting point, usually when we're going to do a case study and is something you can probably observe, which is basically the fact, the but, and the so, which is essentially like, okay, this is the fact, this is what happens, but we noticed X and Y, so we did this. So it's usually, it's I'd say it's a good like place to start, but then it's cool to try to break a little bit away from that. So it doesn't also feel, so it doesn't feel monotonous and like just again like oh my god like i've seen the same structure a thousand times but i always think it's good to start there because i also know like you might try to start building a case study and just go like oh we're gonna do something crazy and then it doesn't make sense and then it's like oh wait like the first thing is people gotta understand what i'm saying like i gotta make sure the facts are in there i gotta make sure all the information is clear and then once you get that, you can start tinkering with what like what can come before, what can come afterwards. And I think like something very important is like the sooner you get to the idea, the better as well. Because I mean, people are, you know, you think about it. I always think about this. Probably someone in a jury is going to be looking at a thousand of these couple days. So like if it's if it starts boring and, you know, they'll probably skip it. So you got to try to, you know, grab their attention as soon as possible. Be concise be be crisp and clear and i think it's always what me and johnny have tried to do like in our case studies is always like how do we iron this down to the most clear version possible always starting with like a very basic structure and then we can try to play around with it it's interesting as well because i think if you look at juries generally from if you look at sort of effies or lions or any of those kind of big international award show the the juries are becoming more and more international which is i think a very good thing yeah I think gradually over the years, we've seen more local case studies winning big international awards. And that I think in the past, they've probably been a bit biased towards like US, Europe, UK kind of things. It's nice to see more awarded work from countries. I mean, I, I spent a lot of my career in South Africa. I think Brazil and South Africa often punch above their weight when it comes to international awards. So, I mean, Brazil like, knocks it out of the park, but you often have a really tricky job of putting across something that's probably very local. I hadn't heard of a lot of the terms that were in this case study, but you, you got to explain it to someone who has no idea what you're talking about. Is there an art to that? Or do you just have to really think hard about it and put it in there and just try and think what's the actual mission critical stuff and how do you do it? Yeah. You want to get the, the facts in there. That's the most important thing. Like what exactly are you trying to communicate? What is the case? What is the idea, you know? And especially with, in our case, we had the Brazilian context. We had to explain it a little bit at the beginning. So one thing that helps, I find, as a copywriter even, is just to have, uh, you know, a real eye for re revision, like editing, basically. And it's something that David Ogilvy himself said. He has a, we have a little book that, that we get when we enter Ogilvy Brazil. I don't know if other Ogilvy's have this. But it's like a super small pocket-sized book with quotes by David Ogilvy. And one of the quotes is, he's not a good copywriter. Well, he's saying, like, I'm not a good copywriter. I just edit, 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 edit a lot. And I think that's true. Like, no one is really a master a god of writing or ideas. But the more you chisel away, eventually you're going to find that diamond that, uh, you know, shines out. And like Pedro said, it's, it has to be simple. It has to be super easy to understand and there's a lot of tricks, I guess, you could use for that. Like, don't use flowery language. Long words are never welcome because people are just going to, you know, get over their heads with it. And also, one thing that's super important that we talk about a lot is that we know the job. We are immersed in the job. But the jury and the people in the world, they're going to see this for the probably just once and super fast. They have no idea. Like, they don't want to stop their day to, to see this. Most of them do, don't anyway. So I uh, just want to make it crystal clear, make it easy to understand, digestible. And I could go on for days about this, but it, it's just simplicity is key. Like 
keep it simple. Stupid is an acronym that we had in, in my university and it stands for KISS, you know, keep it simple, stupid. I mean, it's just the basics of the basics, you know, if you keep that in mind, you're going to be 50% done. Do you, maybe do you share it also with some people who have no idea about the case study and just ask what they think? Share it, share it to a friend who's not in advertising. And so like, does this yeah, make sense to you? Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, 100%. Yeah, I mean, you always got to do the the proof of showing it around to people. You just send them and be like, do you get it? That's, that's all. And depending on the answer, you got to be okay. Maybe we need to tweak some things here. Or maybe it's going somewhere. And I think something interesting also with the international juries, Chris, is also, for example, even the language being used in English now needs to be sort of rethought because you have a lot of people who aren't uh, sometimes like, it's not their first language. Like for me and John, it's not English isn't mm -hmm. our first language. There's a lot of words and terminologies that wouldn't make sense for us. So it's really interesting to you that like, even people that like, for example, here in Canada or, or in the US and stuff in England who usually made case studies in, in English, just thinking, oh, some an, another English speaker is going to grab this, needs to think, oh, wait, now someone who's international might get this. And the language, you know, they need to understand what I'm talking about. So yeah, um, I another, think it's really uh, changed things. Yeah, 100%. So it was another, it was, it was a good backup of you saying, don't use long, complicated words. And I thought it interesting as well, the use of subtitles, I always find very helpful. I saw you use subtitles in this as well. It's yeah, really subtitles, we, uh, I mean, nowadays I always put them in the case study because, uh, yeah, we have viewership from all over the world. And for my portfolio, I just want it to be uh, very easy to understand. I know I have people who have certain uh, needs that they need to read it or they have the sound off, they can't listen to it. So just having the words there helps a lot. That's great. And uh, yeah, I mean, we talked a lot about juries and stuff. I know you said yeah, you'd like to talk a little bit about lines and maybe some of the things you saw this year. Any big standout, standout things? Uh... I think one thing to me that really stood out in Cannes this year was definitely the simplicity. But I mean, obviously, we always talk about simplicity. Winning ideas are always simple. But I think this year, like, it was, like, really, really simple. It's like you look at it, you get it super easy to understand. And some of the ideas that definitely stuck out to me was uh, Cycle Me, the the Coca-Cola one that won the Grand Prix for uh, for print, uh, as well as the um, also the Grand Prix in, in outdoor, which was uh, the Magnum idea, the Find Your Summer. So I'm, again, like to me, it's just like one of those things, Recycle Me again, it's just a, a, a crushed uh, logo of, of Coca-Cola. You understand like, okay, it's like a crushed can, you know, Recycle Me, it's recycle. Like it's, it's so easy to understand and you see it, you get it. It's it's beautiful. It's cool. It's gra really well executed graphically. Same thing for the Magnum, the Find Your Summer. Uh, Find Your Summer, like just that little light comes in and shows that moment that you know it's a colder weather, but the person's enjoying their 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 ice cream. So it's like you can find those spots, and it's so beautiful too. Like the photography is beautiful, and I mean I I love craft. Like I I'm very very you know. I think a, a craft oriented art director. So to me, when I see these like beautifully executed prints, I, I spend like hours looking at them being like, dude, this is so cool. This is great advertising. And I think we there was a lot of that this year. I mean, honestly, like all these very simple ideas, those two definitely stuck out to me a lot. Um, yeah, I think Johnny also has uh, some of the some of his faves, but I think those two are, are the ones that I I'd say for me. Yeah. I share 100% what Pedro said, especially with Recycle Me. And one point that we should mention about that idea is because Coca-Cola has done tons of ideas, right? They've done it. They've done everything. It's almost impossible for you to come up with a truly original Coca-Cola idea, let alone an idea that's super bold like this one. One point from that idea that stood out to me, like the boldness of the client accepting that so another idea that that came out in can this year i love i think it's my favorite idea of all time is um british airways uh the outdoor campaign that won a, a grand prix uh by uncommon london uh, creative studio and i could go on and on about that case i mean it's so so beautiful i've seen it maybe eight nine times ten times I even showed it to my colleagues at Ogilvy Brazil uh, during one of our meetings every Friday. And what I love about it is that there's no um, voiceover. 
it's just the music uh and the the copy obviously the the outdoors but the simplicity of it the you know it's such a minimalist idea for those who don't know I should, maybe I should give a little context it's it's an outdoor campaign that emphasizes the like what what British people truly want from their vacations. I think that's a, that's one way to put it. So if you can imagine, is it now, just British people, or is it is it is it, is I, it not universal? <laughs> I think it is a universal, but in that case, yeah. it was more Locally. like showing the British mindset. I think. Yeah. Well, so for the listeners here and the viewers, if you can imagine like a billboard, and there's one of those check check forms, like there's a. Uh, a blank bullet point and it says business and then another one pleasure but then there's a third one which where there's there's a creative twist which is a really cool and witty and creative headline so for example because the third one would say like because she still loves me or because i'm in remission or i don't know because it's 4 p.m and it's already dark so for a copywriter, that's that's like pure gold. And again, I had the boldness to do something that doesn't play down to people's intelligence. Like, we know you can understand this, like talking to the, the audience, right? And it even directly talked to them because it showed, dur like during the case study, it shows people walking under the, the billboards, the digital billboards, and the, the copy changes to reflect what the person is doing. So if it's a rainy day, it will be a headline that reflects that. Anyway, I recommend everyone to watch that case, rewatch it even, because I think it's one of the best ones out there from from this not only this year but maybe this decade from Can. There's a there's a couple of new campaigns they just launched now for business class as well. That's, I don't know whether you've seen those. Do they quite nice? I haven't actually. Oh, it's really nice. I've seen them. Yeah, they're so good. I'll, I'll I'll pop them up on the slideshow. But yeah, <laughs> um, but yeah, they're they're. Yeah, I mean, a, a fantastic agency and, and brilliant piece of work for, for British Airways. Totally agree. Well deserved for them. Yeah. yeah. Very We obviously, we just talked about some of the can line work, and I know that you wanted to share some, some other bits of your own work, some other amazing case studies. And I believe the next one is from, from Coke, and you actually won, won Lions for this one as well, if I remember rightly. Yeah. You want to set us up for it and, and let's watch the case study. This was a campaign for Coca Cola, uh, Brazil. And it was for Christmas a couple years ago. So again, this was an idea that, uh, if I'm not mistaken, once again, it came from the creative department. It was just our creative director and his ACD uh, when they noticed that sometimes the the audio waves from a audio WhatsApp message, they kind of resemble a bottle. And... Yeah, the idea just naturally came from there. From there, it was super easy to understand. The client loved it and everyone got behind it for, for Christmas. And because we work for uh, digital commerce, our goal is always to increase sales and in digital delivery channels. So for example, iFood is a an app here in Brazil where you can order food and drinks, just like Uber Eats. You, you have Uber Eats in the US and UK, I believe. And our goal is always to increase sales. And so that was the objective for this campaign. And I think we can show the case and it speaks for itself. Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas! People love sending WhatsApp audios during Christmas. Especially in Brazil, a continental country and WhatsApp's second largest market in the world. So, when we challenged them to draw the iconic Coca-Cola bottle using WhatsApp audios, everyone went nuts. Coca-Cola Magic Audios. The first chatbot-based WhatsApp experience that turned people's bottle-shaped audios into magical gifts. Analyzing each audio in only a few seconds required loads of intelligence, the artificial kind. That's why we trained Coca-Cola's chatbot with thousands of audios, teaching it to analyze waveforms, shapes, sounds, and even accents. The more audio sent, the more the AI learned. We even taught it to disqualify words related to other brands and to identify mispronunciations. Magic. 
The people who were able to draw the bottle won amazing gifts to share with their loved ones. Sounds simple, right? Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas! Not so much. Over 12 million seconds of audios were sent trying to draw the bottle. Two weeks of promotion got us more than 4 million messages sent. 100,000 new users registered in the Coca-Cola WhatsApp base. 400,000 Christmas audios sent. Now, people will never stop seeing drawings in WhatsApp audios. Bravo. That's fan fantastic. I, I love what I love about it as well is when, whenever I see a, a, a little audio note now, I'm always going to think of Coca Cola. So it's a good, uh, good long term memory in there as well. Yeah, yeah. I should mention that we won uh, two Bronze Lions, so one in mobile and one in brand experience and activation. And we won two shortlists awards as well, so one in digital craft and the other in, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So, uh, once again, I'm so grateful for that. Um, I almost couldn't believe when it happened. It was my first, you know, Can Lion for, for Pedro as well. And on top of the Can Lion Awards, we also won like London International Awards, one show, you know, Brazil's Creative Club Award. I think that the best part for me was just telling my family the news and just, you know, also winning it with an idea that's super fun. I think it, you're talking a lot about fun advertising. Instead of advertising nowadays, because we see a lot of cases that are just downer or gloomy and with hard topics, which they should do. But it's always refreshing when, and I think the jury this year noticed this, when there's uh, ideas that are based on fun and, you know, something you want to share, something that's funny. I think humor is coming back, which is a welcome sight after the, the COVID pandemic. But yeah, in a nutshell, that was Magic Audios for, for Coke. I guess it's also so nice when you share it with your family and you're like, it's a massive brand that everybody knows. And you've probably exactly. yeah. you've been seen this like somewhere. <laughs> like, that, that, um... that does help a lot. Yeah. Oh, and yeah, again, yeah, we were just so happy. And uh, it's a super simple idea to, again, talking about simplicity, like it's a WhatsApp audio in the shape of a bottle, like can't get, you know, simpler than that. So we're just so happy when we won. And I mean, it was a really fun project to be a part of and work on and see the idea finally happen. I remember the day we had this call and it was like, oh, it's live guys. And I was like, okay, awesome. So it was, it was really cool. Yeah. Uh, brilliant. I'd love to give it a go. It was so good that you moved to Canada. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and that, you mentioned in the case study there that you had to uh, you actually had to train up like a little ai machine to be able to identify the different sound waves obviously ai is a hot topic in our industry for obvious reasons i guess it's kind of yeah. another amazing tool with which to to try and make even better work with how, how are you guys approaching Using that, have you got any thoughts on that? Any tips, recommendations for other people? What should they do with it? How can they take advantage of it? Any things that you've learned so far? So I think that AI has definitely changed the industry, like especially how a lot of the, the way, for example, even building presentations, you know, everyone uses a lot of AI generated images or uh, just for other things. I mean, there's just going to be so much still changing with AI now. And I mean, now video is is coming in soon very because because until now we had a, already good images and statics but video is coming in really strong now with the, the new Sora I think that when it, in terms of ideas though the AI should always be complementary to make the idea happen I do believe that like th there was this wave of like eight things done with AI ideas so it's like oh glass done with AI cars done with AI this done with AI so I think that sort of phase has passed and now it's more of a thing like how can AI help an idea sort of happen so I think in the situation of Magic Audios the AI like was more of something that allows the idea to happen but the idea isn't like an AI the idea is like draw the the famous bottle so the AI it just becomes something that helps again speed up the process of an analyzing the bottle instead of being a person who has to do it you have an AI do it you can make it something you know massive and just have again thousands of people like recording and sending audios and i think that's what made it fun too so 
it's it, it was very gamified you know all of us tried drawing and it, it was really cool and so i think that's how i see it like it's really like the use of ai for ideas it's really about like how they add on to something that isn't necessarily focused around ai and for day-to-day -day use i think again our directors you know should be learning how to use all the mid journeys of the world and just using it for your presentations and everything what if particularly for art direction is there anything that you've learned that you were like oh god now i know how to do that that's way easier like is it is there a particular way that you do your prompts or is there a particular like i know if we were experimenting with it or we're always experimenting with it but one thing we found is asking for revision seems to often be a less fruitful task than just totally redoing the prompt and starting again <laughs> oh yeah um, i totally agree but yeah, I mean, what are some of the, the key things you found when you're trying to get good visuals out of it that work or don't work? Well, I mean, I feel like even online, you can find a lot of like the, the almost pre-start of prompts. What I feel in general about prompts is that you'll be able to get very like uh, maximalist ideas or like scenario styles, but you won't really be able to get very specific stuff out of it. So I think uh, that's a big thing. It's like knowing how much you'll actually be able to get out of it. But I'd say just like the usual commands. I also feel like certain image AIs do certain things better as well. So for example, I think a mid journey is always better for like hyper-realistic stuff, but I still like using a dolly for for something that's a little more graphic that isn't as, as hyper-realistic as mid journey. And also I think uh, versions also influence because in mid journey, there's, there's like so many different versions. I feel like older versions were more artsy, like you could get artsier stuff out of them. I feel like the new ones are kind of losing that a little bit, which is good because you get hyper realism. But at the same time, uh, you know, you lose some of that artsy edge that you could get before. So you mentioned uh, this very casually, you were like, yeah, there's loads of websites where you can get like nice prompts from to start you off. Like, <laughs> is there any that you, <laughs> that you use or like, or is that like, do you just, I don't know, how do you find those websites? Do you just Google it? <laughs> I, I just Google it. I'll be honest with you. It's uh, I, th I think there's like, there's these pre-prompts that you use. Again, I just kind of got a couple of them off Google and, and use them. But mm -hmm. I feel like the newer versions of Mid Journey, they're starting, you're starting to need less of those. Like I, I remember, mm -hmm. especially in V1 and V2, you needed to put this crazy thing, which was like a hyper-realism applied to this and that with the something ratio. Like, I feel like we're, you don't need that in the in the newer versions of of a uh, mid journey. So I, I agree. Yeah. Well, I think that ten generally tends to happen with technology, right? It's like mm -hmm. you have to be really precise at, at first, and then and then it gets better as you go along. Because I mean, if if you look at the usage of AI right now, it's less than one percent of people who have tried it end up yeah. continually using it on a regular basis, which is a very low percentage. And that's unlikely to change if you need to be very specific about your prompts all the time. I mean, there, there will always probably be some art to it in that, like, there's an art to using Google. <laughs> some people are really bad at using Google. I watch some friends sometimes searching for things, and I'm like, how are you expecting to get the right result from that, <laughs> from that prompt? But um, I'm sure that will always be the same with AI. But I would imagine if, if it wants to get really good, then you're totally right at you shouldn't need to do such detailed prompts. Yeah, yeah. but and and I feel like the the newer versions are we're starting to get to a place where the you can be more objective with your prompts, which is great. I mean, honestly, again, the, you can access Dolly as well through Bing, so you can also just Google like Bing images, and you can use Dolly there. And I think it's it's been pretty pretty easy to use. It's not as hyper realistic as Mid Journey, but I use it sometimes because I think it's it captures really well what you say and you don't need a, such a long prompt to so guess at the moment the way that you're using these is is often for mock-ups and just getting giving people an idea of something because i imagine there's all sorts of probably red flags around <laughs> copyright material and like uh, can you use it for real work and not um yeah what, yeah. what are you finding so far what, what are you what kind of things are you using it for in day to day i'd say I'm probably like, mostly yeah like you said for presentation visuals uh reference images it's a lot more of that like mm -hmm. i think again there is a big discussion around how these things are going to be copyrighted and all that but that's a whole other can of worms that is still going to be you know figured out in 
again in the t- near future. But I think that for work, I feel like a lot of people still want to use the, you know, still want to photo things, still want to like actually produce it because I mean, want it or not, you do have more control when you produce it. Like the AI, like you can go really well with AI, but there's a certain level of, of sometimes like specifically something you need that it's, we're not there yet. I mean, maybe someday we'll get there with AI because the speed it's evolving is insane. But uh, as of now, I feel like it's mostly just mock-ups, references, but we'll find out. I mean, it's a very, it's a crazy future. So yeah, go ahead. I guess the other thing with the visual side of it is, and I don't know whether you use this yourself much, but even in tools like Photoshop or other things, maybe you're using it for making quicker edits to existing imagery or existing and therefore, you're not having to worry about the copywriting thing. It's just that AI is al- allowing you to do something that would previously take you hours. Oh, like 100%. Five seconds. Oh, um, 100%. Totally. Because I think when you think about AI, you're often, you do immediately maybe go directly to like Dali or whatever. But actually, there's a whole load of AI tools built into a lot of the, the day-to-day tools that we use. In, in oh, yeah. The, the generative fill in um, Photoshop, it's a... Uh... It's a blessing. Thank, thank God they added that in. Like you save up so much time. I mean, I, you know, old school way you have to like, you know, manually edit the image, you know, to take away parts, use other parts of the image, you layer them out. Like it's now you don't need to do all that. You circle it, be like, remove this can and it removes it. <laughs> so that's a, a really good use of AI. Like every art director definitely loves the generative fill and those little things. I feel like, you know, the more they improve that, the better it's going to be. And I'm excited to see what, what the next things, how these things are going to evolve, man, because it's been helping a lot. And I feel like it can be even cooler in the future. Totally agree. So Johnny, we've had the visual side of things. I'm guessing you've been more preoccupied with the written side of things. But I mean, I know you're naturally curious, so you're probably you've investigated everything, I'm sure. Well, I mean, I try. Uh, I think for the art directors, it's definitely helped a lot. And in my case, I use mostly ChatGPT. I'm one of those copywriters who hasn't really used that that much. But like, I'll give an example. One time, and I can't go into too much detail because it's like a confidential job for an agency, but (laughs) I can see it's for Coca-Cola. And uh, I basically had to come up with names for uh, an idea for the campaign. And so I gave the prompt. I, you know, I got a bunch of results, maybe 30 or 40. Most of them, I think, were just rubbish, uh, unusable names. But some of them, even the ones that I couldn't use, they had a direction that was interesting. And I was like, oh, this, this could be something, you know. It wasn't the, the final name. But what I'm trying to say basically is that uh, it's a tool, you know. It's something that you should have in your toolbox to give you a, a direction. In this case, generating names. But for, for headlines or body copy, it helps a lot with translation because at Ogilvy we do a lot of Spanish and Portuguese and English back and forth translations. So I used it for that because it's very accurate in that sense. But for ideas themselves, I think for now we're good in terms of like the human capacity. For example, coming up with safe flags or magic audios, even if it's it's got a little bit of AI, the idea itself in magic audios was super uh, insight driven and human driven. Like I said, it was two creative directors going back and forth and saying, oh, this looks like a Coca-Cola can. And I'm also one of those that they don't really believe in like doomsayers. Like, oh, the world's going to end. Or I do think a lot of professions, I mean, obviously it will happen. We'll, we'll be, you know, we'll be gone in the near future. But uh, like Anselmo Hamo said, the, the CCO of GUT, the agency, copywriters uh, should, be, should be safe. You know, they shouldn't worry. Only the bad copywriters should worry. <laughs> so... Nothing really changes, you know. I think you still have to be at the top of your game. You still have to be curious. Above all, be 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 uh, be passionate about what you do. Care about what you do. Those are the pillars for any profession, let alone advertising. Because I see a lot of people who come into this business, especially people who are creative, 
naturally, you know, oh, I like movies and stuff. But I always think like, do you actually love advertising? Like, do you really like it? You know, you have to like it because most of us will be this for the long haul. I mean, I hope to be. And so it takes, you know, a certain kind of maybe obsession <laughs> for some of us <laughs> in a good sense. And yeah, just endless curiosity. I know, Chris, you believe in with 42 courses. And uh, well, going back to AI, yeah, it's just a, another tool in the toolbox. And I, I welcome it. I think it's it's awesome. But I still think that we uh, should depend more on, on the human brain, you know, which is a very powerful tool in itself. It sounds like you're kind of using it as a sort of to get over the blank page syndrome. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it gives you a head start. And, and yeah, I've heard lots of people describe it as like having infinite interns. Like they're not very smart yeah. interns, but like right. looking at 50,000 ideas or 5,000 ideas, like you, you'll be able to spot the good from bad. And as you said, even if it's not actually there, you maybe it takes you down a direction that that yeah, it can that, give you like a little gold nugget of something right. that can become great. Right, for sure. Uh, I, I agree. We found that much like you were saying, if you give it lots of context, it can come up with quite interesting results. So, what we've done is created a, a template for you to type in your own prompts. It's like, hi, I'm in Brazil. I'm a copywriter. I'm working on Coke. Whatever it is, like you, you give it as much information as you can. We prompt you to to say what to say or say what to write and then when you're taking a lesson say if you were learning about system one and system two thinking on behavioral science it, it would give you a summary at the end of like a few bullet points of how you could use system one and system two thinking in your day-to-day -day job based on the client that you were job that you're doing right um, and we found good results from that but it does seem to be critical to to put in the right context up front yeah, you're gonna have like to guide and give it a nudge Yes, yeah, yeah, the direction yeah. you want, obviously. Totally, totally. And then the the final thing I know we wanted to talk about was the future of ideas. A, a very chilled out topic. I mean, <laughs> quite a big thing. But uh, yeah, please, please do go ahead and explain what you were meaning by that. I think uh, obviously AI is one of the topics of the future of ideas, and I I think Pedro and I have talked kind of in general about that just now. I've always been a very positive person, optimistic. And I think I'll, I'll always be that kind of guy who always sees the good in things. So I do think that, especially after seeing Cannes this year and seeing the lovely work from British Airways and Recycle Me and, you know, Burger King always does excellently at the awards. Advertising is definitely not dead. They always said, like, when the when TV came along that radio would die. Radio has never died. Radio has, like, evolved into something that's awesome like Sirius X, X, um, XM, Spotify, uh, Deezer. So I think people have to be very careful when they say, oh, this this will die or this is over or, you know, just take a look at history. And it's not even that far away from us, like not that long ago, that uh, things just adapt, you know. And so I think basically for the future of ideas, we have a tremendous responsibility to uh, care about the work as long as we care and we're the stewards of, of this work, I think everything will be fine. There will obviously be up bumps along the road, which is natural. It happens all the time, but I'm very optimistic. I think even more awesome ideas are going to come from the clients I mentioned. I'm just excited to be in this industry right now, to be alive in this, in this point in time. Let's see. I think uh, in terms of creative talent, which links into the future of ideas, you know, like we have to have people who care about the work a lot. And I think it's working out fine. Like there are tons of ad schools, like Miami Ad School is an example. And I've been to it physically in, in Rio de Janeiro. The, the students there are very passionate too. They always have like their hands up for proactive ideas. And it's crazy the amount of talent that's coming out. And in summary, I'm just very optimistic. I think it's such a wonderful time to, to work in this career. 100% Johnny. Agree with everything he said. And I, yeah. I think it's a great time to be having ideas and I think simplicity is back. Fun is back. You can craft is definitely back too. you know, like a crafty ideas that, you know, good ways to show aesthetics, good writing. And honestly, I think that it's very exciting. There's a lot of, a lot of cool work still to be done. And I'd say the future is definitely the simplicity though, to me is, uh, is what I'm noticing is I, I feel like, you know, bold and simple. I mean, it's always pretty much always been the thing, but I think now it's more than ever the thing. So that's 
totally what I think it's gonna where it's gonna go. Uh, so I can I just say one more thing. Yeah. Um, because Pedro just said bold and simple. And I was remembering, I don't know why, but I remember David Ogilvy's older work for the was it the Bentley car that he did the Rolls um, Royce. Yes, like the electric clock, you know, that's the the sound you can hear in the in the car. Yeah, sixty miles an hour. Yes. You can hear the thing you'll hear in the cars. It's so good. We we live in different times. Like this was decades ago and simplicity and minimalism was present at the time. But I think it's even more necessary right now for many reasons. The main reason is people's attention spans. They say that we have the attention span of a goldfish nowadays, which is five or six seconds. They've done uh, studies on this. And so to break that tension barrier, you need simplicity. You need ideas that are, are digestible, easy to understand at a glance. You can't even take 10 seconds. It has to be like one second, maybe even less than one second. So yeah, what I'm trying to say is that nowadays, it's never been more important. We always say it's it's never been more important, but this is for real this time. We truly need minimalist crafts, beautiful ideas, easy ideas, hacking ideas, which are on vogue and very welcome in my view. If you had to give people listening to this podcast like one kind of piece of advice just if they wanted to get better at their creative work what would it be for each of you i think for me definitely try to put your idea into a sentence i think that if you can in one sentence tell your idea to someone i think you're starting to get to something very interesting so i'd say do the one sentence exercise it's definitely gonna help perfect so johnny i mean <laughs> There's so many things that a person can do, but if I had to choose one thing, like one main thing to start, I think I advise them to do the training, like do a lot of training. If you can absorb content, a lot of content, especially in your younger days, and if you love that content naturally, that's going to be like 60%, maybe 70%, I think, of the work. So that would be my main advice for anyone trying to come into this field is just to be uh, constantly learning and Go be like the extra mile. If you think you're like comfortable, just go a little further, you know, Mm -hmm. maybe like one thing I do when I watch movies, I watch the entire movie, even the credits, because I think there's crafts to the, to the credits, like the end credits have their own typography. There's even a soundtrack at the end. That's part of the movie. Like someone thought of that soundtrack for the end credits, you know, just go the extra mile and don't give up. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I love it. It works. Yeah. Now, look, fantastic advice, and uh, I really, really appreciate both of you uh, taking out your time to to be so generous with with everything you've shared today. And I really can't wait to hopefully meet you in person someday soon, uh, preferably when you're on stage picking up a Grand Prix or something at Lions. That'd oh, be nice. Hope so. Hope so, um, Chris. Who knows, man? Yeah. Would love We're to. Next yeah, out there, yeah. so. Maybe next year, man. Yeah, you, you, you got to. You, you got to do some remote working together. Maybe uh, pitch some more ideas to Coca Cola, and uh, hope, hopefully uh, see you there. Be, be Look, lovely. I just want to—I want to say thank you first of all. And Pedro's obviously going to speak a little bit soon, but again, for the viewers and and and, and listeners, I've I've been following Forty Two Courses since 2019. I've done maybe 20 of their courses, and I'm not trying—I'm not trying to plug Forty Two Courses. Like, I'm just saying that I genuinely like the content. And this, like this podcast was an idea that Pedro and I had. What if we participated with Chris? And so another piece of advice I would give to people in this field is just don't be afraid to like reach out to people that you think are impossible to reach out to. And Chris is obviously an an awesome dude, as you can see (laughs) and hear. (laughs) Some people are going to be a little more closed off, but even them, I think you should go to. And you're going to find that they're just natural. They're normal people. Don't be afraid to put your foot out there and make contact with them. 100% agree. Ne- never be scared to do those things. I think people are generally nice and willing to help if you yeah, they want to ask help. nicely. <laughs> Again, for sure. Awesome. No, yeah, just thank you so much, Chris. Again, really, really appreciate it, man. Thanks for having us. Thanks for setting this time aside. I know it's super late over there in, in London, man, in the UK. So honestly, just really appreciate it. And honestly, it was a great talk, great chatting. So thank you so much. I learned a lot. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it again. And uh, yeah, look forward to chatting soon. Yeah, we love it. it. (laughs) We hope you enjoyed listening to this 42 Courses podcast. If you did, please like and share. Uh, Any comments are also very, very welcome.
And of course, if you want to learn more about us, visit our website at 42courses.com. Thanks again.